As I was studying this passage and I was looking at the history surrounding the writing of this passage, the, the prologue to Peter Jackson's Lord of the Ring movies came to my mind. There's a line in there, and this is going somewhere, I promise. There's a line in there where the narrator says, history became legend and legend became myth. And some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. And I thought of that because this passage here, the debate over this passage is whether history was written down later and portrayed as prophecy, or if this was true legitimate prophecy that was given ahead of time and then fulfilled. There was a third century Greek philosopher named Porphyry of Tyre, and Porphyry absolutely despised Christians. Third century, this is the late 200s. This is when the church is beginning to ascend in a very short time. The empire itself will become Christian. He wrote a book called Adversus Christianos. You can hear it in there. It means against the Christians. And one of the major points of that book that remains relevant to us today is he looked at the book of Daniel, chapter 11, because the Christians at this time made a very big deal about the fulfillment of prophecy as a reason for believing in Jesus. And he looked at Daniel, chapter 11, and concluded there's no way this could be prophecy because it is too detailed and too specific. He says, every country has oracles, every country has prophets. None of them give anything that is this detailed and this specific. If you've read like the Odyssey, you know that it's always like a bird flew away with a snake and they interpreted that as something. But this is so specific and so detailed and so accurate. He said, there's no way. This was obviously a forgery. And he was the first one to make that claim many hundreds of years after the book was written. And we know about this because Jerome, one of the church fathers, wrote a response to Porphyry defending the book of Daniel and instead, as we're going to do, holding it up as an example of, this is why our God is different than your gods. Your gods speak in shadows and innuendos and maybes. Our God gives dates. Our God gives specifics. He gives long narratives of what's going to happen in history. And that means that this chapter is either the most specific of Old Testament prophecies or a total forgery after the fact. And in fact, the discussion over this book has not really moved past the days of Porphyry and Jerome. This is either a real prophecy or it's not. If it's not, then it's just a lie and it doesn't mean anything. But if it is, then it's true, and that means everything else in that book you're holding is true. And the implications of that are, of course, staggering. As we've said at the beginning of the book, I'm not going to get into it again, the internal evidence of Daniel and all the history and tradition we have surrounding the book of Daniel places it in the time of Babylon and Persia, that it was written when it was said it was written, which means all the things that happened in this book hadn't happened yet, which means as we walk through this and you see how closely it lines up to uh, actual history, I hope that you will be persuaded and convinced and encouraged in your faith in the scriptures. And if that is the case, then Daniel's warnings at the end of this chapter about the coming Antichrist and the terrors that he's going to enact are to be heeded, and the God that gave them are to be, is to be worshipped. In our case, it wasn't that history became legend, it's that prophecy became history. And the devil is working hard to transform history into just legend or myth. And we cannot let that happen. That's why we carry the torch of God's word together. And we're going to begin by reading the first four verses of this. Even if you're here and you're not sure you believe all this stuff, here's something for you to chew on and think about, because you have to answer this one way or another. Verse 1, And as for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. I'll explain who all those pronouns belong to in just a second. And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. You've got to take this passage one piece at a time because it can get real complicated, but there's a whole lot of cool things to learn here. Looking at verse 1, as for me, who's speaking here? This is the angel from chapter 10. And we discussed chapter 10. This is either an angel 
or this is the capital A angel of the Lord, meaning a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. It does not affect the interpretation of this passage, but it certainly is something wonderful to read about. I'm not going to get into that again, but this messenger from the Lord, whoever he may be, says that in the first year of Darius the Mede, which is when Persia overtook Babylon, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. Well, who is him? Verse 21 of chapter 10, him is Michael the archangel. Chapter 10 revealed that the movement of history from one nation to the other is behind the scenes being worked out by angelic and demonic war. We call that spiritual warfare. And he says that they're contending against the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. And he mentions Michael. And this angel who is speaking said, I started fighting alongside Michael on behalf of Israel when Darius came to power. We're going to talk about more about Michael next week. So for now, we're just going to move on. The point is, he's saying, I fought alongside Michael. Verse 1 probably should have been placed in chapter 10 when it was divided, but that's okay. But now he's going to give him the truth, and he's going to give him the future of the kingdoms concerning Jerusalem. The last half of Daniel is all about the nation of Israel and Jerusalem and the Jews. And he's saying, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, the movement of nations surrounding your city and your people. And he says... Three more kings are to come in Persia. The king at this time was the mighty Cyrus the Great. Overseeing the province of Babylon was a a lesser ruler by the name of Darius, and that's the one that Daniel interacts with. But this is still the first ruler of Persia. So he says there's going to be three more, and then there's going to be a fourth one, and he's going to be significant. After Cyrus, the time of Darius and Cyrus, there were a guy named Cambyses, There was a king named Smyrdas who only reigned for a short time because he assassinated the the heir and tried to force his way in. And then another king named Darius, not Darius the Mede. This is Darius I, the Persian. You did have three kings. And the fourth one, he says, the fourth one shall be far richer and through his riches shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. The fourth king after Cyrus was King Xerxes. That's X-E-R-X-E-S, if you're looking for baby names, Xerxes. If you've read the book of Esther, he's called Ahasuerus there. Kings then, as they do now and throughout history, had various names that they would use, throne names and the like. This is King Xerxes. And it says that he would stir up against the kingdom of Greece. That is exactly what happened historically. If any of you are movie buffs and you've seen the movie 300, which talks about the Persians attacking Greece, and that's the legendary story of, I mean, it's a true story, but it's legendary in that it's very cool, where the 300 Spartans stood at the hot gates in that narrow pass and held off over a million Persians for days and days, giving the rest of the Greeks time to rally. That was King Xerxes. That was Esther's husband. So that might be connecting some dots in your mind, that that's who that was. And uh, he did attack Greece, and he was defeated at the Battle of Salamis, which was a sea battle, and it was a major defeat for the king of Persia. And it was that attack that prompted the Greek city-states that had been independent to ally with each other and say, if we're going to have empires like Persia marching on our soil, we've got to unite, we've got to be prepared to fight against him. That happened in 480 BC, if you're taking notes. I don't have notes uh, slides for you today, I apologize, but... This is King Xerxes, Esther's husband, fighting against the Spartans, the Athenians, and then all the Greeks together at Salamis, defeated in 480 B.C. And then in verse 3, it says, Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion, and do as he wills. This mighty king, we've talked about him several times in Daniel already, this is Alexander. This is Alexander the Great, the son of Philip of Macedon, who conquered the kingdom of Persia. He, it was a three-year campaign from 334 to 331, and he conquered all of the Persian Empire uh, in, in just a very short period of time while he was still very young. And we've talked about him at length in chapter 7, so you can go back and listen to that one if you like. But it says in verse 4, As soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided to the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled. Alexander died at, I believe it was age 32. He was very young. He had two very young sons and a wife named Roxanne. All three of them were assassinated by people that wanted to take his throne. And his kingdom was divided into four pieces. Now it says the four winds. So that, and that's why the, uh, 
the, remember the ram or the goat that we had, the picture of the goat in chapter 7 whose horn was broken into four pieces? This is what you have. The Greek kingdom, the big empire of Alexander, was divided into four pieces under men called the Diadokoi. And that means the inheritors or the successors, the Diadokoi. And we covered all of that before. That was chapter 8, actually, not chapter 7. But what we're going to see now is, yeah, the kingdom was divided, but we're going to get a lot of prophetic detail concerning that Greek kingdom. So we're getting to about the 330s or the 320s BC. We're just going to keep on going for about another 200 years here as we get into verse 5. So the kingdom has been divided to the four winds. Keep that in mind because he says in verse 5, Then the king of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he and shall rule, and his authority shall be a great authority. We're going to be discussing in this chapter the king of the south and the king of the north. These are the two most important Greek successor kingdoms of the Diadokoi. The one in the south was centered in Egypt, so the king of Egypt, and was ruled by a dynasty called the Ptolemy dynasty. That's P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, Ptolemy dynasty. In the north, the king of the north, this would be covering Syria and going out to the east towards Babylon and even up towards the, uh, the subcontinent of India. This kingdom was called the Seleucid kingdom. You actually would have pronounced it the Seleucid kingdom, but that sounds weird because everybody else says it the other way now. So the Seleucid kingdom in the north and the Ptolemy kingdom in the south. And it tells us, the king of the south shall be strong, and he was, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he and rule, and his authority shall be great. The king of the north was aided, his name was, was Seleucus, and he was aided by King Ptolemy in driving back another one of Alexander's generals called Antigonus. And so the king in the south helped him and kind of was the strong one in that relationship. But the kingdom in the north would grow much stronger and would be a much larger kingdom than that of Egypt. Although what's relevant for us today, the Ptolemy dynasty, the southern Egyptian kingdom, was the one that was in charge of Judea and Jerusalem. And that's going to be the battleground between them for what are called the five Syrian wars. This is about 300 BC that those two kingdoms were established, if you're, if you're keeping track here. Verse 6, after some years they shall make an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he and his arm shall not endure, but she shall be given up and her attendants, he who fathered her and he who supported her in those times." This describes a marriage alliance that happened in 252 B.C. between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. There were two wars in those 50 years, between 300 and about 250, two wars that happened between Syria and Egypt, the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south. Well, in 252, Ptolemy II and a guy named Antiochus II, king of the north, they decided this is enough fighting, let's have a marriage alliance, and that's what they did. Ptolemy sent his daughter Berenice up to the north to be married to Antiochus II. Now, this was a problem, because Antiochus II was already married. He was married to a woman named Laodice, which is like Laodicean, it's a similar name. He divorced his wife and sent away his son, to do this, to marry Berenice, to bring peace. But you'll notice that prophecy tells us, she shall not endure, neither shall those that raised her up, neither shall he, her husband. That's exactly what happened. Laodice came back and murdered Ber Berenice and her son. Now, the, the question of history is, did she also assassinate her ex-husband? Because he died under mysterious circumstances, and people say, you know, she was willing to kill everybody else to get back to the throne. Perhaps she killed her husband as well, although we can't be certain about that. And at this point, uh, Ptolemy II had already died, I believe. He was weak at this point, so he was kind of powerless to stop it. She did not endure. So Laodice comes back and installs Seleucus II as the king. And this sparked the third Syrian war, which we read about in verse 7 talking about Berenice here, a branch from her roots, one shall arise in his place. He shall come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal with them and shall prevail. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods with their metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold. And for some years he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. 
This is the third Syrian war. Ptolemy III is king now. His father had given his daughter to marry the king of the north, but she was killed. So was his nephew. So was her husband. The alliance was broken. So a branch from her roots, this is Berenice's brother, Ptolemy III, invaded Syria. And Jerome actually gives us the best history we have of this, that this was a colossal victory by the king of the south. He took away 40,000 talents of silver from that kingdom, and he plundered all of their temples and took away, he said, 2,500 golden idols and other holy vessels. That was a five-year war between 246 and 241 BC, exactly as it was described to Daniel here. And there was a little bit of peace until verse 9 says, Then the latter, meaning the king of the north, shall come into the realm of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. This describes that after this war was over, the Seleucid kings made a couple of territorial gains, but they weren't gaining anything new. They were just gaining back what they had lost before, which is what he says. Come into the realm of the king of the south, but return to his own land. Verse 10. His sons shall wage war, the king of the north's sons, shall wage war and assemble a multitude of great forces, which shall keep coming and overflow and pass through, and again shall carry the war as far as his fortress. He's referring to the sons, the next two Seleucid kings, one of which is not really relevant to our story, but the next one, Antiochus III, who is also known as Antiochus Megas, which means Antiochus the Great, is the focus of most of the rest of this chapter until we get to his son, Antiochus IV. Antiochus III was much more aggressive. He was taking the fight down into the land of Judah, which was Ptolemy territory at this point, and made an alliance with the governor of what was then called Palestine and Phoenicia, this, this region, made an alliance with the governor to overthrow the Ptolemy king, which is what it says. He shall overflow and pass through and carry the war as far as his fortress. But verse 11, the king of the south, moved with rage, shall come out and fight against the king of the north, and he shall raise a multitude, but it shall be given into his hand. And this is exactly what happened. This is a very famous historical battle that Ptolemy IV, when Antiochus III is marching on Judah and is taking back the land and making alliance to betray their, their ruler at the time, Ptolemy IV defeats Antiochus at the Battle of Raphia in 217 BC. This is up near the Philistine city-states, near Gaza and Ashdod. It was in the Promised Land, 217 BC. It's a really interesting war. If you go back and look it up, they had elephants and all kinds of cool stuff. But Raphia, that was where Antiochus III was defeated. And verse 12, and when the multitude is taken away, so after he's lost that battle, his heart shall be exalted and he shall cast down tens of thousands, but shall not prevail. For the king of the north shall again raise a multitude greater than the first. And after some years, he shall come on with a great army and abundant supplies. So this is what happened over the next 15 years. So he was defeated, and it says the king of the south will get bold and will be brave, but it's not going to work for him. Over those 15 years, Egypt declined while Syria began to ascend. They're forging new alliances. They're making alliances up in Asia Minor. They're making alliances with the budding empire of Rome at this point, who's going to begin to figure into the story. And in 202 B.C., 202 B.C., Antiochus III attacked Egypt again. And verse 14, in those times, many shall rise against the king of the south and the violent among your own people, meaning the Jews, shall lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they shall fail. Then the king of the north shall come and throw up siege works and take a well-fortified city and the forces of the south shall not stand or even his best troops, for they shall be no strength to stand. But he who comes against him shall do as he wills, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his hand. This is when Antiochus attacked. And it describes in verse 14 that the Jews in Jerusalem fought against their Ptolemy ruler. They wanted to overthrow the Egyptian king, but what happened is, Jerusalem was one of the battlefields of this war, and the Ptolemy kings actually defeated the Jews at Jerusalem, which is what he described. They shall, they shall uh, fail to fulfill the vision, verse 14 says. But although the Egyptian kings won the battle, they ended up losing the war. Antiochus defeated the Ptolemies at a place called Panium, 
which is near Caesarea Philippi, in 200 BC. And then it said he took a well-fortified city. This was the last straw that broke the kingdom of the south. When they were fortified in the city of Sidon in 198 BC. The big battle was in 200 at, at Panium, but they kind of retreated into this city and they figure if we can last this siege, maybe we can negotiate a peace. But the king of the north, Antiochus the Great, broke the siege of Sidon. And from that day forward, from 198 BC forward, the king of the south no longer had control over the land of Judah. It came into the hands of the Seleucid kings, the northern king, the Syrian king, which is not going to end well for the city of Judah, or for the nation of Judah, the city of Jerusalem. And then verse 17, here's what's, what is going to, and that we know did happen next. He shall set his face to come with the strength of his whole kingdom, and he shall bring terms of an agreement and perform them. He shall give him the daughter of women to destroy the kingdom, but it shall not stand or be to his advantage. So you see that there's an attempt at diplomacy here. Antiochus III was not content just to take Judah away. He wanted to conquer the entire kingdom. So what he does is he says, we're going to have a marriage alliance. And he sent his daughter, whose name was Cleopatra I, to marry the Ptolemy prince. This is not the Cleopatra that you are familiar with, who married Mark Antony and all of that. That's Cleopatra VII. This is the first of her name, and her uh, descendant would be Cleopatra of Roman history. Well, she married Ptolemy the V. Ptolemy V at this point was between 7 and 10 years old. This was not a romantic marriage, as you can see. He says, I'm going to send my daughter to go marry this little boy so that she'll be able to push him around and do what I want her to do. But this actually backfired on him, as you see. It says, it shall not stand or be to his advantage, because for whatever historical reason, Cleopatra did as her husband asked her to do and sought the benefit of the southern kingdom rather than that of the north, which was very frustrating for her father Antiochus. Verse 18, afterward, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall capture many of them, but a commander shall put an end to his insolence. Indeed, he shall turn his insolence back upon him. This is what happened after this. Okay, so the thing with Cleopatra didn't work. So what he begins to do, if we're not going to conquer anything to the south, how about we go north? And he goes up into the regions of Thrace, which are up in Asia Minor, up into Bulgaria, modern-day northern Greece, and begins to attack these other coastal cities. Because as far as he was concerned, I'm the successor to Alexander, remember. All of this belongs to me anyway, so I'm going to go and take it back. And he was successful in conquering most of Thrace until he ran up against another empire that was rising up at the time, which was the Roman Empire. Now all of a sudden, these two empires are clashing together in the land of Thrace. And they said, you can't go any farther or we're going to fight you. And this led to a war between the Seleucid kingdom of Syria and the empire of Rome. And it was in 190 BC at the Battle of Magnesia, which is a very significant historical battle that you can read about in a lot of Greek and Roman histories. The Battle of Magnesia. Antiochus III lost. And it says he lost to a commander. This was true. He wasn't fighting the emperor. He was fighting the Roman commander, Scipio. And he was then placed under the Treaty of Apamea, where he had to give up all of his holdings up north out of Syria, up into Asia Minor, Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And his son, Antiochus IV, was taken hostage. We'll see more about him later. Another little historical note here. Antiochus III's ally in this battle was Hannibal of Carthage. So you maybe know about Hannibal and the Punic Wars. Well, he was an ally of Antiochus, and this is part of the reason that Rome hated Hannibal so much. Part of the deal at the Treaty of Apamea after the Battle of Magnesia was, you've got to give Hannibal over to us. He's going to be our, he's going to be our captive now. And Hannibal fled rather than, be, than submit to that, and it would be some time until he was actually defeated. This is before the elephants going over the Alps and all of that, but this was kind of pre, the precursor to that. And it says, verse 19, Then he shall turn his face back toward the fortresses of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. Antiochus III, who was called Antiochus Megos, remember, Antiochus the Great, who did more for the Seleucid kingdom than anybody else, died a very ignoble death. After this 
embarrassment at the hands of Rome, he decides he's going to go to some of the rest of his kingdom, and he's going to kind of, you know, suppress them a little bit in order to to make himself feel good, I guess. And not only that, but he had a lot of tribute that he had to pay to Rome now. So he goes to a place called Elemis, which is in modern-day Syria, and he started pillaging the temple of Baal in 187 BC, and he was assassinated by the priests in that temple. So that's, that's kind of what he means. He shall turn back to the fortresses of his own land, but shall stumble and fall. As in, he wasn't, it wasn't a great military defeat. He stumbled and shall not be found which is what happened. Can you see the incredible detail here? That I'm not, I'm not mixing and matching. I'm not trying to make things work. This is exactly what happened in history. And even secular scholars agree with that. Their answer to it is not to say that Daniel got it wrong. Their answer is to say nobody could have known this unless they wrote after the fact, even though every archaeological and internal and traditional evidence points us that it was written when it said it was written, which is before all of this. I would encourage you, go out and research the Syrian wars for yourself, the five Syrian wars. I just gave you um, a, pretty much an overview of most of this here. But I also just, let me throw out there that it's important for us to know history in general. This, that's an important thing for us as citizens of the world to know about. And uh, the more you realize this, the more you learn, okay, so a lot of this stuff has been done before. And you start to, to gain a little bit of historical humility, shall we say. There's a lot to learn. But let's get on to verse 20 here. Then shall arise in his place one who shall send an exactor of tribute for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. Antiochus III, his son Seleucus IV, became king after this. And he was saddled with all of his dad's war debts, and he was contracted by the Treaty of Apamea to pay tribute to Rome. So, according to verse 20, what we know from history, he sent a tax collector by the name of Heliodorus to Jerusalem to say, you need to give us everything out of your treasury so that we can pay off Rome. And this failed. History tells us that Onius III, who was the priest at this time, refused to do this, and Heliodorus left in shame. The Hebrew tradition is that when Heliodorus came, there were two angels that came out of the temple and beat him senseless, and then he went home. So neither one of those is scripture. You can pick which story you like. But when Heliodorus came back empty-handed, rather than face the king, he assassinated Seleucus IV. A lot of assassination going on in this, this part of the story. But in verse 21, in his place shall arise a contemptible person. Bible calls you contemptible. You really messed up. To whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. This is the scourge of Jerusalem. This is the terrible Antiochus IV, who's known as Antiochus Epiphanes. Here's what's happening here. Antiochus IV, who was another son of Antiochus III, although not the first in line for the throne, when they lost that battle to Rome, he was sent over to Rome as a hostage. You're going to live here, we're going to treat you nice, but if dad messes up, you're dead. That was, the, that was the deal. Well, after he had been there for, I believe it was either 12 or 15 years, there was a swap that happened. And Demetrius, who was the son of Seleucus IV, the current king, replaced him as a hostage. Now, this makes sense, right? Because a king is much more likely to protect his son than his brother because, you know, kings killed their brothers all the time in this day and age. But now Seleucus IV is assassinated. So Antiochus IV becomes king regent at this time until such time as Demetrius will be able to take the throne. But a lot of very suspicious things happened at this time. A court official in Rome named Andronicus assassinated and killed the young Demetrius, who was the heir to the throne. Antiochus IV then married Seleucus, his brother's widow, and adopted her son as his own, who was also named Antiochus, Antiochus V. What he's done through this, and many people believe that he actually asked Andronicus to assassinate his nephew, he now, through a couple deft moves, has become the king of the northern kingdom, even though he was not in line for that throne. And this is what it says about him, through flatteries, coming in without warning. He was in, an intriguer. He was contemptible, as it said. And we keep reading verse 22, armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant and from the time that an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, and he shall become strong with a small people. 
Without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province, and he shall do what neither his fathers nor his father's fathers have done, scattering among them poil, plunder, spoil, and goods. He shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time. These are very general descriptions of him here, that Antiochus was a cunning general and a ruthless ruler. And one of the questions we ask is, is which place is he plundering that is describing here? He comes into the richest parts of the province and begins to plunder it. Well, he did this to a lot of places. He most famously did it to the land of Israel, the land of Judah, as it was called then. But he also, every covenant that was broken with him, he, he broke. That was made with him, he broke. Especially there was one with the, the king of Pergamum who had supported him in his bid for the throne. And later on, Antiochus betrayed him and broke that covenant. This was the kind of man he was. And it says that he would even attack the prince of the covenant. This is either... An angelic reference, meaning that, that the prince of Israel will be put down and the prince of Greece will rise and have success against him. Or, as I think is more likely, this is referencing the fact that he would remove Onias III as the priest of the land. This is a significant moment in Israel's history because now somebody else is telling them who's going to be the high priest. And this actually led to the death of Onias III, who was a righteous man by all the accounts that we have. Just kind of giving us a sense of who this guy is. The Bible doesn't think much of him. Verse 25, And he shall stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall wage war with an exceedingly great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for plots shall be devised against him. Even those who eat his food shall break him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. And as for the two kings, their hearts shall be bent on doing evil. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail, for the end is yet to be at the time appointed. This is Antiochus' invasion of Egypt. His nephew Ptolemy VI is king now. But Ptolemy VI had, was a, still a very young man. His mother had been the queen regent, but there were two officials that killed his mother, and they set themselves up as the regents, meaning they were ruling instead of the, of the rightful king. This gave Antiochus, whose sister Cleopatra had been, had been killed by these men, this was his pretense for invading, invading Egypt. He sacked Memphis, which is modern-day Cairo, a major city of Egypt, and surrounded Alexandria and laid it siege. And when he comes to the negotiating table and he's talking to his nephew and he says, hey, I just want to negotiate this so that you can be king. But it's pretty obvious to him that I'm just wanting to set you up as my own puppet king. And he's like, I know what you do to your nephews, man. I'm not, I'm not trusting you. You killed the last one and the other one you kind of brought under your wing and now you're in charge of all that. So what Ptolemy does, this young king, behind his back, is he negotiates a new uh, situation with the two officials that were ruling at the time, and they had something called the Ptolemy Triumvirate, that they were all three ruling together, but he was made the nominal king. So he's no longer under a regency. He's technically ruling, even though these other two have authority as well. What this does is it gives Antiochus no longer a legal pretense for invading Egypt. Now he's just a conqueror, which if you have to get allies and you have to gain the support of the people, isn't really going to work for you. So he withdrew. He tried, to, uh, he tried to force his own way, but it says, verse 28, He shall return to his land with great wealth, but his heart shall be set against the holy covenant, and he shall work his will and return to his own land. The Roman Empire pressured him to return at this point. They're starting to interfere in this part of the world a little more. They say, we don't want any more fighting between Egypt and and Syria, because we like it when the other Greek city-states and empires are weak, because that enables us to be strong. So that's in 169 BC that Antiochus IV withdrew from Egypt and went back to Judea. And it says, his heart shall be set against the Holy Covenant. That's exactly what happened. When he came back, because he had deposed Onias and set up a guy named Jason, there had become this war over the priesthood. And he had not only deposed J uh, Onias, he deposed Jason later and set up a guy named Menelaus. Well, now Jason, the second high priest in this rule of three, is attacking number three in order to take the position, which is exactly what God intended for his priest to do, isn't it? Is to fight over who could be high priest. 
Well, he comes back, and I imagine he's in a pretty bad mood because he just lost this war in Egypt. And here he sees these Hebrews squabbling over who gets to be priest over some temple he cares nothing about. So what he does is he puts down the rebellion and plunders the temple. He took away all of the golden articles. He stripped the gold off of the walls and all the rest of it so that he could at least get something out of this campaign that he had had. Verse 29. At the time appointed, he shall return and come into the south. But it shall not be this time as it was before. For ships of Kittim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw, and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the Holy Covenant. In 168 BC, just a year later, he tried to invade Egypt again. Kind of gathered his forces and was like, all right, I don't really care about making this look good. We're just going to go in and conquer this time. Maybe he thought he could have fooled his nephew. Didn't work. So they're just going to go and attack this time. But he was stopped, it says, by ships of Kittim. Kittim is an Old Testament reference to Cyprus and up in the, the other coastlands in the Mediterranean Sea. It's often used in reference to the Philistines who were of Greek extraction. They came through Cyprus and came to the land of Israel. This is a reference to the Romans. The Romans showed up in ships with a fleet against him, once again stopping him from conquering Egypt. So this is the second time now he's been thwarted by Rome. And once again, he's got to go through Judea on the way back. And once again, he's going to encounter a war for the priestly succession. And once again, he's going to bring the hammer down. His heart shall be set against the Holy Covenant. Or sorry, he shall take action against the Holy Covenant. Verse 30. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Again, a priestly rebellion is underway here. Jason rebelled once more. And Antiochus IV Epiphanes has decided, I've had it. I'm going to win something here. And this is when things got really bad for the land of Israel. It says he set up the abomination that makes desolate. That's the famous abomination of desolation that you've heard of before. He converted the temple of the Lord that had been rebuilt under the days of Ezra, and Zerubbabel and all of that, and converted it to a temple for the worship of Zeus. He placed an image of himself and an image of Zeus in the holy place. He overlaid the bronze altar with an altar of his own design, and they were sacrificing pigs on the altar in Jerusalem, which of course is the like ultimate unclean animal in order to worship a false god of all things. Not only that, he began to burn every copy of the law. He outlawed circumcision. He outlawed Sabbath observance. If a woman was found to have circumcised her child, she would be crucified and the son would be hung around her neck to die. He was a horrible person. He did terrible things. He brought in philosophers from Greece and from I mean, his own kingdom, I would imagine, to oversee the transformation of the culture, the Hellenization of the culture. So the whole world had be kind of become Greekified by this time, Hellenized. But he says, these Hebrews are digging in their heels, and I've had it. So he sets up these, like, almost like in Soviet Russia, you had political commissars whose job was to enforce the belief that they held, of worship of the gods and the philosophy that they had. He set up Hellenistic priests in the temple who would not be serving the Lord, but be serving his own gods. They built a gymnasium in the the city of Jerusalem, which was where the, the men would have the Olympic Games and that sort of thing. But it was always done nude, and it was always done in honor of the false gods. Two things that, of course, were totally abominable to the Hebrews. They were forcing men to shave their beards. It was a terrible time. They were stripping their culture away by force very fast. But you see what it said. Those who know their God shall stand firm and take action. And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. The people who know their God did indeed resist him. And this is what we know as the Maccabean Revolt. When, while this was going on, the enforcement of worship of the false gods in the village of Modane, which is in the land of Israel, there was a Greek official that showed up and found out that they were worshiping the Lord on an altar there. And he says, this is not going to fly. You, Mr. Priest, whose name was Mattathias, you, Mattathias, are going to worship Zeus on this altar right now. Mattathias refused. 
So the official said, fine, we're going to pick a new high priest. Who's willing to do this? And out of the crowd, there was a, a Jew that raised his hand and said, I'll do it. And as he walked up to that altar, this old priest, Mattathias, struck him down with a sword and killed him over the altar. And then when the Greek official protested, old man Mattathias turned and struck down that Greek official with the sword too. And they staged a revolt and wiped out all the Greeks that had come to this place. That was the beginning of what is called the Maccabean Revolt. They ran out into the, to the hills and the mountains, and they began to lead a guerrilla resistance. Mattathias had five sons who were also priests, the oldest of which was named Judah, who was such a warrior and such a leader, he took the name Judas Maccabeus, which means Judah the Hammer. That's a pretty cool nickname if you're going to be a warrior, right? Judah the Hammer. And in 164 BC, they took back Jerusalem and they cleansed the temple. And that's the famous story of Hanukkah, where the oil lasted for eight days. We see Jesus himself celebrating the festival of lights in the New Testament. That's a reference to this time here. It says, when they stumble, verse 34, they shall receive a little help. Many shall join themselves to them with flattery. And some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help. That little help that they got, if you're following the story, you know who you're going to call if you're having trouble with Antiochus Epiphanes. You're going to call the Romans. And that's what they did. They secured an alliance with Rome. I should mention, by the way, why he was called Antiochus Epiphanes. He began to print coins with his face on it that said Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes Theos, which means Antiochus, the appearance of God. He was claiming to be God himself and was demanding worship as a God. He was a madman. Behind his back, they called him Epimanes, which rhymes with Epiphanes, but Epimanes means madman, which is exactly what he was. So if you're having trouble with this madman, you call Rome, which is what they did. And the Romans, they, they, although Antiochus wanted to come back and take back Jerusalem, they wouldn't let him launch a full-scale assault against Israel because they said, if you do, we're going to fight you. So he would send these small armies, but Israel was able to fight them off. And they established their own dynasty in that, that place, which is called the Hasmonean dynasty, the Hasmonean kings. And the first one was a guy named Simon, who was one of the sons of Mattathias, the priest, which is a no-no if you know your Bible because the priests and the kings were not to be the same person. And in 110 BC, the Seleucid kingdom collapsed. And the, the Jews in Judea had independence for about 75 years. But as you see there, they were joined together with flattery, and some of the wise shall be stumbled so that they may be refined and purified. And if you know the Bible pretty well, refining and purification is not always a pleasant process, which is exactly the case. In 63 BC, I mean, first of all, the Hasmonean dynasty was not always a godly one. This is when the Pharisees started to rise up because the Hasmonean kings who had begun as these priests that were fighting against Hellenization themselves began to enforce Hellenization on their own people. They began to act, walk, talk, and govern like Greek kings. So you get guys called the Pharisees whose entire point was we want to maintain our culture and we want to stick to the law. And it got so bad at one point, one of the Hasmonean kings crucified 800 Pharisees in one day. It was not a good time. This was not the restoration they had been hoping for. And then in 63 BC, Rome took control of Judea. This happened because in order to broker this alliance, they had trusted in a man named Antipater, who was an Edomian, which means he was a descendant of Esau. He was an Edomite. And Antipater made this deal with Rome and said, if you install me as king, I'll get you more tribute than these troublesome Hasmoneans are. And that's exactly what happened. Antipater became the king of the Jews and Esau, a son of Esau, ruling over Judah. He had a son by the name of Herod. And that is where we find Israel when we begin the New Testament. The son of Antipater. Do you see why they hated him so much? Do you see why they were not happy with Rome? And he says that they would be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, meaning that stage that they entered when Rome took them over is going to endure until the end. We'll get to that in a second. I just one more time before we move on, I want to point you to the details of this prophecy. This is exactly how it happened. And it's almost hard to study this. Wow, I wonder what this means until you open up a history book. It doesn't even need to be a biblical history book. 
You read it and you see, this is exactly right, which is why people like Porphyry and modern day scholars say, this couldn't be prophecy. But my God is able to do things like this. And for those of you who have heard people say like, well, the Bible gives prophecy, but it doesn't give details. I don't know what else you call that. People that say things like, well, the prophecies, they could mean anything. And that's kind of how God does it. It's general. We could never know. Except that it's so specific here that people are like, you cheated. (laughs) And for people who say, well, when the the end times prophecies, they're going to be fulfilled, but we can't possibly know what they mean. And you don't want to press the text too far and don't look to the details because we simply can't know. That's not the way any of these other things have been fulfilled already. So looking at how this was fulfilled makes me feel perfectly justified in interpreting the book of Revelation, Matthew 24, the book of Daniel, Thessalonians, the way that I do in great detail, even though I am humble enough to admit I don't think I can grasp all of it. But I think when we get to the end, it will, those books will read like books that were written after the fact, because that's how our God does it. He mentions in verse 35, the time of the end, the appointed time. And in verse 36, we're going to get a major time jump in what's being described here. This is pretty much universally acknowledged by by conservative Christian scholars, evangelical scholars, and even some that are not evangelical, that we're going to move so far beyond Antiochus in this next section that we're talking about the time of the end. And I think this is pretty plain as we read it. But we're going to stop talking about this king of the north, and there's going to be a different king that we talk about here. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished for what is decreed shall be done. Right there, you can see Antiochus did not prosper until the indignation was accomplished. He fell and the indignation was handed over to Rome rather than Greece. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers. That's something Antiochus Definitely did. He paid way too much attention to the gods of his fathers. Or to the one beloved by women. More on that in a second. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these. A god whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. In verse 36, we are transported to the time of the end. As we see in verse 40, it mentions the time of the end here. This is an example of what's called telescoping in Bible prophecy. You know, you've got a telescope like this, you collapse it, and it only looks about this long. There are many passages in Scripture where things that are going to happen in the immediate future are placed right alongside things that are going to happen in the eschatological future, which means the end of the world, and that's what we have here, although the difference is pretty clear. These verses go way far beyond Antiochus. These verses are talking about the Antichrist. And because Antiochus IV was a type or a prefiguring of the Antichrist, there's a lot of parallels between their their lives. But he's not the same person. 1 John 2 tells us there have been many Antichrists, but they all are prefiguring the last one who's going to come. We've already discussed him quite a bit in the book of Daniel. He's called the little horn. Remember the story of the beast with ten horns? And then the little horn came up and dominated them all. He's going to dominate the final empire that will come. He's going to make a covenant with Israel and all the nations, and he's going to break it halfway through. He's going to desolate the land of Israel. He's going to defile the temple. Jesus, in Matthew 24, tells the people of Israel to look out for the abomination of desolation. Now, if that's only referring to Antiochus, that's already happened. Jesus is talking about this is going to happen again, but greater and worse. That's what the Antichrist will do. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4 says, Let no one deceive you in any way, meaning as if to say we're living in the last days right now. That day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, referencing Daniel 11, I believe there, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. This is the Antichrist. 1 John 2.18 says, you know that Antichrist is coming. This is Satan's last effort. This is every terrible world ruler that you've ever seen is going to be far outstripped by this guy. Napoleon, Attila, 
Mao, Stalin, Hitler, Antiochus, anybody that we look at and say, I'm glad I don't live under that guy. This guy is going to be far, far worse. But Revelation 13 tells us that all the world is going to go after him because Satan is going to be able to perform miraculous signs that makes everybody believe that he really is God. The imitation of Jesus there is pretty obvious, Antichrist. And our passage that we just read, I mean, it confirms some of the things that we've learned here, that he's going to be a dominator. He's going to be a warrior. He's going to have this mighty war machine that he's going to unleash on the whole world. He's going to be a blasphemer. He's going to succeed. I mean, this is something you've got to know. The Antichrist is not going to be stopped until Jesus returns. Once Jesus removes that hand of restraint and allows this to start, it's going to be finished. So there's really, the only thing the Lord has told us to do to hasten the coming of the Lord or delay the, the day of darkness is to evangelize the world. There's nothing you can do to stop it politically or anything like that. Verse 37 tells us that he's a godless man. And this is such an interesting little passage. You can meditate on this on your own. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or the one beloved by women. Let's look at that one beloved by women thing here. I've heard that verse used to say that the Antichrist is going to be a homosexual. Because the older translations phrase it, he shall pay no attention to the love of women. But the ESV translates this properly. It's not saying the, the love that he has for women. This is talking about an object that women love, that which is beloved by women, the love of women, right? And this could either mean that he is just not going to have any time for wives or for women. He just cares about conquering and destroying the world and that he's not going to be setting up a dynasty for himself. He's just a, a conqueror. That's all he does. Or, and I think this is very likely, considering what you see in the rest of this, that the one beloved by women is an ancient Hebrew reference to the Messiah, that there was a hope that all the women of Israel had that I might be the mother of the Messiah. That, of course, went to Mary, as we've been learning about lately in this Christmas time. But I think in any case, it's true. He's not going to have any time for the actual Messiah. So that's true, however you want to interpret that. But he shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers, no attention to any other god, but shall magnify himself above all, honor the god of fortresses instead of these. And that seems to be kind of a sarcastic thing. Right there. His god is fortresses. His god is tanks. His god is you know, nuclear missiles, whatever his thing. That's who he worships. But then in verse 38, it says, A God whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign God. So the question is, all right, is he godless or isn't he? Right? Is, is he worshiping a foreign God and, and invoking his help to win these battles? Or is he declaring that he will be God? Well, Paul makes it clear in 2 Thessalonians, he will declare himself to be God. So what is this foreign God stuff? This is what is described in the book of Revelation, that there will be what's called the great harlot. There's going to be this worldwide religious system that is going to be used by this guy. Because if you read in Revelation, he does not have any time for all of that nonsense as he probably sees it. So whether you believe this is a revived Roman Empire or whether you believe this is a revived Islamic Caliphate, I think both of those possibilities are possible. He's going to give lip service to whatever gods are being worshipped, but it seems from what we know about him, he really doesn't care. He is an entirely selfish human being. And I mean, if you really want to nail it down, I mean, that foreign god is Satan, isn't he? And it's interesting, if you look at what Satans believe, they say that to be a true Satanist is not to worship Satan, but to worship yourself. So that would be quite in line with what the Antichrist is going to do. He functions like a terrible dictator. Notice how he says he divides the land as he sees fit. Pretty much, he's going he's to conquer the world. You can have that, you can have this. He doesn't care about the boundary lines, doesn't care about ancient territories. He's just going to give it away as he sees fit. But as we get into verse 40... Something that is often missed about the Antichrist, especially, I think, as much as I love Tim LaHaye as a Bible scholar, and I very much enjoyed the Left Behind books too, this is something I think that those, those approaches miss. The Antichrist is not going to have a peaceful kingdom. It's not going to be like everything's hunky-dory, but he's persecuting Christians on the side. It's going to be war after war after war. Wars and rumors of wars, Jesus said, right? Look at verse 40. At the time of the end, so again, we're at the end here. The king of the south shall attack him. Who's him? The king of the north in our context. The king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. This is 
one of the assaults that's going to come against the Antichrist. And as we keep reading here, he's going to give some of the names of these kingdoms. And I think this is going to reveal to us a little bit about what the makeup of his kingdom will be like. So follow me here. He shall come into the glorious land, that's Israel, and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand. He's not going to touch Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. That is modern day Jordan, if you're keeping score at home. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become the ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver, and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. Egypt, Libya, and Cush. Cush is Ethiopia, often called Ethiopia in the Bible. That is modern-day Sudan. This is North Africa, northeastern Africa, Libya, Egypt, and Sudan. Although he's passing through Israel, and he's passing by Jordan along the way. He's crushing these three kingdoms that are mentioned here, Egypt, Libya, and Cush. As you remember, the Antichrist, when he rises up, is going to uproot three of those ten horns. And many people, including myself, believe that we are given the identity of those three kingdoms here. That would be Egypt and Libya and what is modern-day Sudan or whatever the equivalent might be at that time, what the Bible would call Ethiopia. And the Bible tells us that when the Antichrist rises up, It'll be at the midpoint of the tribulation period. And that when he rises up, it is going to be to remove these three horns. There's all kinds of other things that go into it. This is when he sets up the abomination of desolation. This is when he has that head wound that he recovers from. And it seems that when he does that, when he exalts himself as God and king, these three kingdoms that are part of his coalition say, are you out of your mind? We're not following you. This is what you, gotta, you can't miss when you study these end times prophecies. It's not all unity. It's a big battle for seven years. So he's going to invade these African kingdoms, and he's going to destroy them. And he's going to consolidate his authority here. Jordan is spared. Moab, Ammon, and Edom. And that's important to note. We'll talk about this more next time, because... It seems, from what we can tell from Bible prophecy, that there will be Jews hiding in this part of the world at this time. And that it is one of the main places where the battle that Jesus is going to fight against the Antichrist will take place is in the land of Edom. So it's almost like he's leaving those alone, but Jesus is going to come for him in the end of days. We'll talk about that more next time. Now, we don't know how long there is between verse 43 and verse 44. We know that this is all going to take place within that latter half of the seven years, three and a half years, so not very long. But it says in verse 44, News from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, Jerusalem, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. The east and the north, there's going to be news that's going to come his way. What is that news? It could be, there's, there's two options here that I, I think could both be true. And we'll discuss this more when we get to the book of Revelation. It says that Babylon is going to be destroyed by the Antichrist. That the Lord says, I'm going to pour out my, my wrath on Babylon in one day. But if you read carefully, the instrument that God will use to destroy the city of Babylon is the Antichrist. Because remember, he hates Babylon. He hates that world system, that religion that has been set up in his name. He wants himself to be worshipped and him alone. So if you believe that this is an invasion, it could be that. Revelation 16 gives us some, some interesting notes on this one. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits performing signs, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Revelation 16 tells us that the river Euphrates is going to dry up and it's going to become a highway for armies from the east to march and gather at Armageddon. And here's where some of the details will have to be saved for another day. But what we know is going to happen, the Antichrist is going to gather an army at Armageddon, which is in Israel. He's going to pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. We know that Babylon is going to be destroyed by him. 
So that could be his first step. Maybe that there's news from the east and the north that there are other kingdoms rebelling against him, and he goes and defeats them too. It doesn't specify. But we also know that after that, he's going to march on Jerusalem and besiege it. That's the next step here. He's pitching the tents in, in the land of Israel. And in fact, some people believe that in the New Testament, when it says Babylon, that's a code word for Jerusalem. And that would make an awful lot of sense in this context, although I'm not entirely convinced about that. He's going to march on Jerusalem. He's going to besiege it. He's going to ravage the city of Jerusalem. Ezekiel 38 and 39 this is the Gog and Magog invasion, if you're familiar with Bible prophecy. It says that there will be a grand battle against Israel, against armies from the south, the north, and the east. And that Jerusalem will be ravaged and that the Antichrist will be victorious until the Lord defeats them. And I'm of the opinion that that invasion is the same thing as the Battle of Armageddon. More on this next week. And the Antichrist will be defeated. The first spot, the Bible says, is in Edom. So let me just run a scenario by you real quick. Let's say the Antichrist hears news from the north and the east. So he comes back. He gathers his forces for battle in Armageddon. They march on Babylon and destroy Babylon. They come back to Jerusalem. They destroy Jerusalem. Then they hear all these Jews that saw what we were doing are hiding in the wilderness. Let's go get them too. They march on the land of Edom, and that's where it says he will come to his end with none to help him. And we're going to read next time about how Jesus will tread the winepress of Basra, which means he's going to come out of the land of Egypt toward Jerusalem with his robes dripping with blood, and it ain't his blood. His end will come with none to help him. I kind of dove into some details that are not specifically given in this passage here. What we know from this is that the Antichrist is going to exalt himself at the head of a mighty war machine. Three African nations will rise up against him, but he's going to crush them. Further invasions will call his attention away, and he's going to crush them all, including Babylon. And then from Megiddo, from Armageddon, he will ravage Jerusalem and chase the Jews into the wilderness until the Messiah comes to war against him. Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, the Lord said, I am God and there is no other, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done saying, my counsel will stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. When God prophesied the Syrian wars, he was right, down to the details. So when he prophesies this Antichrist who's going to rise up and all the terrible wars he's going to fight, we know this is going to come to pass because he was right about everything that came before that. History is in the hands of Almighty God, and he told us what is coming. So the question becomes, are you ready When is it going to happen? Jesus says it's going to happen like a thief in the night. You're not going to have a clue. All you can do is be ready at any moment. Because the true king, the rock that is going to break that final kingdom, as Daniel saw in his dream, is going to crush that final king. And then there's going to be judgment for all mankind, the living and the dead. Are you prepared to face judgment for your sins? Or do you want to receive the mercy that Jesus Christ offers today? Because if this passage is true, then y'all, everything else in this book is true too. And it's told us that there is no other way to salvation than through Jesus Christ and his blood shed on the cross. You need to bow your knee to that king before he comes and takes back the kingdom that is rightfully his.